Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is June 25th. The Battle of Little Bighorn fought on June 25th, 1876 near the Little Bighorn River in Montana Territory pitted federal troops led by Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer against a band of Lakota Sioux and Cheyenne warriors. Tensions between the two groups have been rising since the discovery of gold on Native American lands. When a number of tribes missed a federal deadline to move to reservations, the U.S. Army, including Custer and his 7th Cavalry, was dispatched to confront them. Custer was unaware of the number of Indians fighting under the command of Sitting Bull at Little Bighorn, and made his forces, and his forces were outnumbered and quickly overwhelmed in what became known as Custer's Last Stand. Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, leaders of the Sioux on the Great Plains, strongly resisted the mid-19th century efforts of U.S. governments to confine their people to Indian reservations. In 1875, after gold was discovered in South Dakota's Black Hills, the U.S. Army ignored previous treaty agreements and invaded the region. This betrayal led many Sioux and Cheyenne tribesmen to leave the reservations and join Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse in Montana. By the late spring of 1876, more than 10,000 Native Americans had gathered in a camp along the Little Bighorn River, which they called the Greasy Grass. In defiance of a U.S. War Department order to return to the reservations or risk being attacked. In mid-June, three columns of U.S. soldiers lined up against the camp and prepared to march. A force of 1,200 Native Americans turned back the first column on June 17th. Five days later, General Alfred Terry ordered George Custer's 7th Cavalry to scout ahead for enemy troops. On the morning of June 25th, Custer, a West Point graduate, drew near the camp and decided to press on rather than wait for reinforcements. At midday on June 25th, Custer's 600 men entered the Little Bighorn Valley. Among the Native Americans, word quickly spread about the impending attack. The older Sitting Bull rallied the warriors and saw to the safety of the women and children while Crazy Horse set off with a large force to meet the attackers head-on. Despite Custer's desperate attempts to regroup his men, they were quickly overwhelmed. Custer and some 200 in- men in his battalion were attacked by as many as 3,000 Native Americans. Within an hour, Custer and all of his soldiers were dead. The L- Battle of Little Bighorn, also called Custer's Last Stand, marked the most decisive Native American victory in the worst U.S. Army defeat in the Long Plains Indian War. The demise of Custer and his men outraged many white Americans and confirmed their image of the Indians as wild and bloodthirsty. Meanwhile, the U.S. government increased its efforts to subdue the tribes. Within five years, almost all the Sioux and Cheyenne would be confined to reservations. And in 1951, America's first colored TV broadcast began on CBS. Posted by Bobby Ellerby. It said, let me start with some things you probably never knew about this historic event. To me, the first day and circumstances seem to foreshadow the overall outcome of this four-month experiment. In April of 51, CBS had just taken over the Peace Theater at 109th Street and 5th Avenue. In a, and in a few quick meetings, it was determined that this would become their field sequential color studio. It was big and empty, but had no air conditioning. CBS called it Studio 57 and moved in five tons of equipment but there was no time for anything else. As you'll see in the 20 photo spread in the June 24 rehearsals, everyone was sweating badly, but the theater heat was the smaller of their problems. That debut show broadcast on this day 65 years ago was simply titled Premiere, and it was the first commercial CBS color program. It was broadcast over a five station network from New York Studio 57, and although there were 10.5 million monochrome sets in the US, None of them could see it because no field sequential sets were made until September of 1951. In less than a month later, production was ordered halted when the Korean War broke out. Appearing on the debut show were Arthur Godfrey, Faye Emerson, Sam Levinson, Ed Sullivan, Gary Moore, Robert Alda, Isabel Bigley, Bill Baird, Marionettes, Saul Horrocks, New York City Ballet, arranged by George Blanchine, Patty Painter, the first Miss Color Television, FCC Chairman Wayne Coy, CBS Chairman William S. Paley, and CBS President Frank Stanton. 
In a nutshell, even RCA could not get the CBS system to work without problems on the VHF frequencies. It needed UHF bandwidth to defeat the flicker of the spinning wheel. Part of the battle with RCA and the FCC over color was CBS's Peter Goldmark's insistence that VHF band be abandoned for all color work and that all black and white broadcasting should be abandoned too in favor of the CBS field sequential system. RCA was leading the way in black and white set manufacturing and Philco and others were making the market there too. So the CBS push was not gaining any sympathy from the industry or the FCC. As a matter of fact, the FCC said to CBS, if you are so sure your field sequential color system is the ultimate viewer, her answer, why do you have so many applications for CBS-owned VHF stations? Having been asked, CBS now had to answer. It was an answer that cost them dearly, too. In a show of support for Goldmark, CBS abandoned five VHF license requests at the top markets, markets they later entered, but at a very high price because they had to buy out the original licensee. A lot of people lay blame at RCA's feet for playing rough, but truth be told, CBS was just as guilty of a different sin, and that sin was mostly about slowing down television's development in any way they could. CBS was not a manufacturer like RCA and others, with their participation in television depended on their ability to make money with a radio network. The success of the 1848 political conventions on TV, which was mostly pooled, had demonstrated the power of the new visual media, and they didn't want to get left behind in TV, but it was expensive and had to be developed in every way. In recent readings, I have learned that even though the great CBS producer-director Worthington Minor, Playhouse 90, etc., had come to understand that CBS was doing it all it could to slow down TV. In the color TV hearings at the FCC in early 1951, he basically said that which honored, earned him a broom closet office across from the 485 Madison Avenue headquarters until the end of the CBS Color Project was halted at the start of the Korean War in October of 1951. Leading up to July 1st anniversary of the start of commercial television in the United States, I'll be adding some new information on the CBS Grand Central Studios history. Enjoy and share, Bobby Ellerby. And finally, in 1956, the last true Packard rolled off the assembly line on this day, although the name would be used on a rebadged Studebakers through 1958. Packard is said to be born out of a feud that started in 1898 between James Ward Packard and Alexander Winton, who produced Winton automobiles. Packard had produced, purchased a Winton, which was the largest automaker in the U.S. at the time, but continuous problems with the car led Packard to offer numerous suggestions for improvements to Winton. In 1899, growing tired of Packard's ideas, Winton exclaimed to him, Well, if you're so smart, maybe you can build a better machine yourself. Packard accepted that challenge and went to work in his Warren, Ohio workshop. By the next year, 1899, he had built his first single vehicle, a single-cylinder automobile. In 1904, the Packard Motor Car Company gained popularity when it released a four-cylinder aluminum-bodied speedster dubbed the Grey Wolf. It was one of the first cars designed explicitly for racing and sold to the general public. By 1916, Packard had established itself as a premier luxury American automaker. It released a revolutionary V12 engine that, that year called the Twin Six. That engine would be adapted for aircraft during World War I, called the Liberty Aircraft Engine. It is often said to be the most important output of all America's war manufacturing effort, and is also the engine that put Lincoln Motor Company into business. Packard remained the top luxury automaker in the United States up through World War II, staying afloat by offering a more diverse lineup of luxury vehicles than its competitors. In the 1950s, sales began to fall. After a hopeful merger with Studebaker, the board of directors deemed the cars too expensive to build. Then president of the newly combined company, James Nance, made the decision to end production of Packards at the Detroit Packard plant in 1956. However, some executives saw value in the name and continued to use it on rebadged Studebakers in hopes of creating enough income to once again produce a luxurious Packard in the near future. That plan failed, and in 1958, the name was put to pasture. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. ThePeopleHistory.com Custer's Last Stand at History.com Color Television on EyesOfAGeneration.com And Packard at AutomotiveHistory.org The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.